So hi, I'm Jacqueline Jansen, and this is my presentation with Kimberly Chernobi, Katie Pettit, and Julie Welch. We are presenting Beyond Parental Leave, a residency scheduling policy for new parents. And this is our virtual presentation for SAEM 2020. So to start, we have no disclosures regarding the policy or this presentation. And we had a few objectives for this presentation. First, to identify residency specific barriers to becoming a new parent. We'd like to review those other policies that are available and introduce innovative, our innovative policy that supports new residency parents at IU, EM, or Indiana University. So why did we create this policy? Well, 46% of trainees are women, and many of these women are, are training during their best childbearing years. 64% of those women actually chose to defer life decisions when we did a review of literature in lieu of pursuing their career. And we found that women who did not defer these life decisions actually reported improved job satisfaction. And finally, and maybe most importantly, is that women are twice as likely to leave residency training for family reasons. So we also found that less than half of GME programs offer uh, paid parental leave. And until July of 2020, so this month, there are no recommendations from medical boards to provide family leave for trainees. So the first thing we want to talk about is residency specific barriers and risks to either becoming pregnant or adding new children to a family. So the first is that working more than 24 hours in a row or working night shifts, both which are inherent uh, to residency training, can lead to pregnancy complications in the first and third trimester. Specifically, there are increased rates of miscarriage, of preterm labor, of delivery of small for gestational age infants, and preeclampsia, among others. Looking at the postpartum period, we know that the postpartum period is crucial for infant parent bonding. It's crucial for breastfeeding. So women who take off more time postpartum have uh, longer and more successful periods of breastfeeding. And then having time off after adding a new child to a family is important for all parental mental health in all settings. Finally, families where they use longer uh, periods of parental leave have lower rates of infant mortality. So a few example policies. Uh, we'll first discuss, discuss a uh, best practices article that was published in ASEP now by doctors Cotabella and Polarski. And in their review of the literature, they found that uh, first trimester poses an increased risk for pregnancy complications and spontaneous miscarriage. And so they do recommend that uh, practicing physicians opt out of nights during that time. And in the third trimester, again, uh, this increased risk of uh, pregnancy related complications and preterm labor. So they recommended out of opting nights, opting out of nights in the third trimester, that these physicians be exempt from mandatory overtime or prolonged times of working to avoid uh, multiple hours of standing and increased stress to the body, and that these residents be scheduled for shifts that can be easily covered by other physicians. So shifts um, that are more desirable or shifts that have multiple physician coverage. And secondly, there's a uh, piloted policy study uh, presented by the Stanford University School of Medicine Emergency and Medicine Department. And this study uh, regards the four weeks prior to um, labor, prior to birth, as well as six weeks after a physician comes back from FML leave. Um, so this, this policy states that physicians should not be scheduled for a sick call, that they should not be scheduled for overnight shifts, and that they should not be scheduled for more than three shifts in a row. And again, that's uh, pregnant mothers four weeks prior to birth. And then any, any new parent physician, either the birth parent or non-birth parent in the six weeks after they return from FML leave, FMLA leave. So now we're gonna talk about how we developed our policy at IU. So first we reviewed the literature, much of which we shared with you here in this presentation. The next thing we did was survey our alumni, residents, and partners of those who'd had children during residency in the preceding three years. After getting feedback regarding, you know, concerns or barriers that they faced and what accommodations would have been helpful, we drafted a policy and then put it to an anonymous vote in our residency. The reason for the anonymous vote was that we wanted residents to feel free to express their true preference. So any policy that reduced or eliminated nights we knew was going to increase the nights worked by other residents. And so we wanted to make sure that residents who were not planning on getting pregnant during residency and by, you know, default would then uh, absorb some of that night shift burden supported this policy, or if they didn't, that they felt comfortable telling us as much. Once we had a policy approved, we then sent it to program leadership for ultimate approval. So the results, when we talked to the um, residents or alumni or partners who had had children within the preceding three years, we found that 
concerns fell into three major categories. The first was number of shifts in a row. This was particularly prevalent concern among women who had been breastfeeding and gone back to work as a resident. And so they uh, frequently mentioned that, you know, going more than two days, so working more than two shifts in a row made it very difficult to transition back between breastfeeding and pumping. And so limiting the number of days that they worked in a row was important for that. The next frequent concern we heard was the number of consecutive night shifts, and this was mostly voiced by partners of residents. Um, they said that being home alone with a newborn was stressful as is, and then doing so for multiple nights in a row compounded the stress, and so not having a partner away for multiple nights in a row was helpful to them. And then finally, there was the issue of the availability of sick call. And this wasn't something that residents articulated to us, but something more that we heard in their responses. So we had a lot of new fathers who mentioned going back to residency work as soon as two days after delivery because they didn't realize that they could use sick call and they had elected not to use FMLA. And so we wanted to make sure that these new parents realize that our sick call policy exists for a reason and that we wanted them to feel comfortable activating it for the birth of a child. So ultimately, this is the policy that we adopted. The first piece is uh, regarding pregnant residents. Pregnant residents in our program are not scheduled for nights or 28-hour call during the first and third trimester. Additionally, this policy is opt-out. So um, as soon as the chiefs find out that a resident is pregnant, whether it's brought to their attention by the resident, you know, or going into the third trimester and it's already known, um, the residents will automatically not be scheduled for these types of shifts because we didn't want residents to feel like they were putting a burden on the program by activating this policy and then feel hesitant to use the policy. It exists for a reason and we want them to use it. However, they're obviously free to reach out to the chiefs and ask to be scheduled for these shifts if they prefer. We also wanted to put explicitly in our policy that miscarriage remained a valid reason to activate sick call. We heard more than once of residents who had either miscarried on shift or miscarried and shortly thereafter gone back to work because they didn't feel like they were sick and they didn't want to use sick call. And we wanted them to know that we supported them during these periods and that we wanted them to take whatever time was necessary for them. With regards to the return to work, um, so our school offers 12 weeks of FMLA to all new parents, six of which are paid. And so in addition to that, we then came up with this flexible scheduling policy. Um, so all new parents can activate or can indicate which six weeks when they return to work they want to be flexible scheduling. Um, we decided not to have a like super you know, strict paradigm um, because there was such a varied response to what sort of barriers different families had faced in the preceding three years that we wanted to make sure we could best accommodate residents however. Um, they saw fit, uh, but we do have some overarching themes. And so the one is shorter strengths of shifts. So our default is to not schedule anyone for more than two shifts in a row during this period. We split up night shifts. So we, um, our default again is to not schedule more than one night shift per string of shifts. And then we reach out to them to see if there are additional day off requests that they have. So our, you know, standard is that all residents get two day off requests per block, um, but really new parents may have others, whether it's because of childcare needs or pediatrician appointments or that sort of thing. And then additionally, we um, put specifically that our sick call policy should be used within the first week postpartum for new parents, um, and that that will be considered an appropriate activation of sick call and paid back uh, as normal, which is one to one, um, versus an inappropriate activation, which would normally be paid back two to one. And then we ask that residents um, try to find shift changes for any period beyond that, but that the chiefs are willing to actively help uh, find the shift trades as necessary. So we put this policy up to that anonymous vote for the residents and 58 out of 73 residents replied. Of the 58 residents who responded, 86% supported eliminating nights and calls for our, first, for our pregnant residents during the first and third trimester. Additionally, 91% of our residents supported flexible scheduling for all new parents in the postpartum period. So we do have a few conclusions. First, residency works schedules inherently carry uh, pregnancy associated risks to new parents and that best practices recommend eliminating night shifts during the first and third trimester and finally that implementing a policy such as this is feasible within residency and to, to date we've had one female resident and what seven male residents exercise this policy successfully without a large burden placed on the other residents uh, further we have had so much interest in our policy that there are a number of residencies outside emergency medicine within the School of Medicine at IU are uh, developing similar policies for publication.